Uh, my name is John Keeve. As uh, she said, I'm at Quartz, uh, where I am the bot developer. I'm one of two people with the name, with the title bot, the name bot in their title. And uh, uh, Emily Withrow is our bot editor. And we are in the Quartz Bot Studio. Um, but I also teach at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. And a lot of what I'm going to show you here, I do both in the bot studio and we do in class. I teach a bots class, a bots module there, and also a uh, prototyping class. So kind of an answer to the last question from the last panel, you know, how can you take this into the classroom? Um, this is one way that you can start playing in a classroom with some of the technologies that you've been seeing on stage. Um, and that's what we do in the prototyping class. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about bots. Um, bots and artificial intelligence. So when I talk about bots, I, uh, there are a lot of things you can, you can think about. Um, things that will do things for you. Uh, those can be bots, automated things. Um, but what we like to think about are the uh, conversational interfaces. Andrew mentioned this a little bit earlier too. Things that you can talk with. In, in the first case, it's things you can type with. All right, so this will be like Facebook Messenger, uh, texting on SMS, things like that. So things, robots you can type with, right? And they type back to you. Um, another uh, area are th things that you can talk with, actually speak to, right? So Alexa and Google Home, um, those things where you can actually have a conversation with your device. So we're exploring that too. Behind those and behind other aspects of journalism, um, that we're looking into in the bot studio is um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, actually getting computers to help journalists do their jobs. So we'll talk about that too. Um, and lastly, I'll tell you about some tools that we're developing at Quartz um, to uh, give to journalists. We are developing free tools for journalists to use, to, do in, uh, to use in their everyday lives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, they're, and they're very bot-like tools. They're tools you can talk with. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, things, robots, and software that you can chat with. Um, and let's start on with Facebook Messenger. So um, a good example of this for if you want to go try this out on your own, what makes a kind of a cool bot is a bot called Poncho. Poncho is a weather bot. It actually will message you every day with the weather. But it's not just about the weather. It's also um, about being a little bit uh, playful about the weather. So for, for example, I don't expect you to be able to read that. But at the top, I've asked, what, what's the weather today? Poncho will tell you every day anyway. But I could ask, and I did. And it said, um, New, York, New York's weather today is going to be clear with a high of 83. It's very playful, very sort of casual. It's got a voice. Um, and then when, when they made Pon Poncho, they found out that people were, were not just asking about the weather, they would ask about other things and start saying other things. So in this case, um, I type, I'm hungry. And Poncho replies with, oh, are you hungry? Uh, what are you going to do about it? And you can order takeout or make a recipe. This is a weather bot. Suddenly I'm talking about making a recipe. Uh, it says, step into my kitchen. Just kidding, I always wanted to say that. Preferably on my own TV show, it's got this personality. And so if it, this keeps going, I end up learning about a guacamole re recipe, which is really about taking avocados and squishing them in your hands. And, uh, and you get a lot of personality about the bot. So this isn't just about providing your latest articles or content. It's about actually having a playful interaction with the audience. So what's kind of amazing uh, right now for me is that within the last few hours, this actually just happened today, we launched um, on one of Quartz's editions. We're, we're coming out with a couple of different editions. One of them is called Quartzy. And Quartzy is Quartz's lifestyle um, section, edition. And seriously, within the last couple of hours, we just launched a chat bot on the Quartzy Facebook page. So if you go to facebook.com slash QZY, which is the Quartzy page, and click on the message button, you can start talking to the bot. The bot will talk to you about Stranger Things. Anybody a Stranger Things fan? 
All right, if you're a Stranger Things fan and you think you know all about Stranger Things, you should go to this bot. Um, it's the first feature that we're experimenting with. Um, so for those of you who are not in the know, uh, Stranger Things, TV series from Netflix, the second season is being released a week from today. Um, so leading up to that, we're, in, we're uh, inviting people who want to binge watch or experience Stranger Things along with us to actually go and chat with the bot about it. And it's a lot of fun, especially if you don't, if you're not a Stranger Things person, it might not be so interesting. If you are, I think it's gonna be fun. But this, we really, I was helping to finish the coding on the train down here and it's actually working. Yay, so that's an example. Um, here's another example, um, SMS text. So it's still around, you saw it. Uh, in, in the uh, Detroit project there, there's definitely still really cool uses for SMS. Um, let me just, let's do a little, a quick experiment. Take out your phones. I know you have them out already. Go ahead and text hi to this phone number, which is, if you can't read it, 512-900-3034. You're gonna get, uh, you're gonna start talking to a little bot that I made. Very simple conversation, it's not gonna take too long. Um, and if it works, you get to learn something about chatbots, and that is that A, one little piece of software that I wrote is now talking to all of you, and there's probably, what, 100 people in here? Maybe more, 200 people. Um, so it's handling all of that in real time, that's pretty cool. Two, it should answer you in the very end, depending on how you uh, answer the previous two questions, so your response will depend on your opinions about pets. Um, oh good, it's working, I can hear chuckles, so that's, that's clear that it's working. Um, and the other thing about this is that this is not hard to make. Something like this is not hard to make. In fact, um, I just taught a class a couple weeks ago in which we simulated exactly this in the class, we built it within about an hour. So this is something that you can do in class, uh, you can do at a publication. Um, one of the sort of advanced uses that some students at CUNY did with this was they went into Harlem and wanted to, uh, handed out flyers, uh, and it was basically asking people if they felt that they had been victims of pro police brutality. If so, text this phone number, and it was, it was uh, in English and Spanish, we had two versions, and it would ask you a quiz. I mean, not a quiz, but a, a questionnaire, basically. And the answers as you answered them would go into a Google spreadsheet that the students could look at, and so they could get data about this survey. So they basically took a police brutality survey over SMS, using SMS and Google spreadsheets. So this is the kind of thing um, that is possible to build, and it's the kind of thing we're building in the prototyping classes. All right. Um, Twitter is another really fun platform to play in. It's good for prototyping. Um, so I'm gonna read this because it's kind of small. You may have seen this uh, tweet by Fast Company. It got a lot of attention in New York, I'll tell you. It said, two ex-Googlers want to make bodegas and mom and pop corner stores obsolete. So bodegas are the little stores in New York on many corners. Uh, these two ex-Googlers wanted to sort of propose this sophisticated vending machine to replace them. Within a day or two, somebody, so this got, I mean, New Yorkers were up, just up in arms about this. <laughs> um, and within a day or two, somebody came out with this thing, this bodega bot. And the first one says, these two x lift product managers want to replace bagel shops with artificial brains. And in fact, every hour it tweets out a new one. Um, and it's, it's, it, you can pretty quickly see the pattern here. It's basically uh, Mad Libs, right? So these two X blank blanks want to replace blank with blank. And this is a fun little experiment you can do in Twitter. Um, somebody made this, it still runs, creates these fun tweets. It's actually something you can do uh, also within about an hour, 90 minutes uh, in a class. It's really kind of fun and also it's a little piece of sort of news art in the world. A little bit more um, serious was the uh, WannaCry virus, which you may have heard of, took over computers in many parts of the world, especially in Britain and the health system there. Um, 
So the way the WannaCry uh, virus worked was that it took over your computer, it encrypted everything on your computer, and then put up this little sign that said, uh, pay, pay money to a Bitcoin wallet, and we will unlock your computer. So it turns out there are three Bitcoin wallets that this thing was tied to. Bitcoin, the way, the bit, way Bitcoin works is that the, wall, the people are anonymous, the people who use it are anonymous, but the wallets are public. So you can actually see the money going into the wallets. Um, Keith Collins at Quartz made a Twitter bot that was watching those three wallets. And every time somebody paid a ransom, it would tweet out and would say, here's how much ransom this, uh, the, these criminals have collected into their Bitcoin wallets. Here, toward the end, it was $142,000 uh, worth of Bitcoin. And it was doing all the conversions and translations. The other thing he did was he had quoted it so that it would also alert the world if anybody took some money out. And sure enough, one night at about 11 o'clock, $20,000 left one of these wallets. These are the criminals taking their money. Um, there were some experts who said that this might not ever happen because it was, they were too worried they might get caught, that the criminals might be too worried that they might get caught. The Twitter bot that Keith Collins at Quartz made broke news. This was international news when this happened, and it happened because of a tweet. Uh, run by a bot. Um, a lot of other organizations, not just courts, saw this tweet, wrote stories about it. It was big news. Um, so that's, that, that, that's Twitter doing journalism for you in, in bot form. All right, let's see if we can talk a little bit about things you can talk with. Alexa. Um, I have an Alexa up here. How many of you, just show of hands, how many of you have Alexa or Google Home at home? Nine, maybe a third, quarter of you. Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you who have Alexa also have children? Okay, so any, those people with their hands up know that there is almost no friction between a person, right, nods, person who is smaller than me <laughs> talking to a device to get what they want. Uh, this is on the way. If you have any question about this, um, just talk to some of your folks, who are your friends who have Alexas and children. Uh, I do as well. Um, the, this is, it, the friction is super low. This is a way uh, that we are going to be communicating with our devices in the future. We already are. So what is, what is the role of news in that, in that world? Um, we're still playing with that. We have some ideas about that. Um, there are some experiments that we've posted online, um, and we're still sort of exploring that. Um, uh, and Joe is going to talk much more about that next. Um, and so th this brings us to AI, uh, machine learning. Uh, this is the ability for computers to learn and help you as uh, journalists, teachers, anybody. Um, there's, some of this is being used in the Alexa and Google Home situations where uh, what is being said is being interpreted by the computer, right? This has gotten really, really good in the last couple of years. So it's one thing to be able to say, okay, if I say, Alexa, what's the weather in New York City to, um, today, uh, October 21st? So then I just said that whole sentence, and the system needs to figure out, you know, those crazy sounds that, that, that I just heard through my microphone, are those, those are somehow words. Okay, so that's been achieved. But then there's a second level which is actually interpreting that, right? So I can actually say uh, to Alexa, I can say, uh, Alexa, do I need an umbrella tomorrow? So I didn't say anything about the weather, I didn't say anything about New York City, I didn't say anything about the fact that tomorrow's October 22nd, that I need a forecast. But that phrase, do I need an umbrella tomorrow, gets interpreted as that. Um, and so that has gotten really good. Computers are getting really good at that. It makes these sort of chatbots and chatter interfaces more possi possible. But that's not all that AI and machine learning is useful for, and we're experimenting with this for journalists. You can uh, use it to detect similarity in things. Um, so you know the sort of sport that folks have where Donald Trump tweets something and somebody goes and finds a tweet from like 10 years ago that either contradicts or is somehow ironic uh, compared to the tweet he just did. So we tried to mimic that using a computer. Computers turn out to not to be so great at irony. Uh, that's still, you guys got that down, humans. Um, but 
it is pretty good at detecting similarity. So this was actually interesting. Um, recently, uh, Donald Trump said Bernie Sanders is pushing hard for a single-payer health care plan, a curse on the U.S. and its people. And interestingly, maybe, maybe not, uh, in 2013, Donald Trump also said the truth is we could have much better health care in our country at a more affordable price. Everyone in the U.S. would benefit. So as a juxtaposition, you start to say, huh, the computer made that connection. Um, it also, uh, whenever Ivanka is on TV, it talks about when Melania used to be on TV, it's very, it's very confusing, this little Twitter bot. But it's, the ability to find similarities can be kind of playful and interesting, but it could also be really important. So this is an analysis uh, bot, uh, machine, machine learning model used by ProPublica. Just came out two weeks ago. What they did is they took a million press releases from all the members of Congress and taught the computer to look for phrases that were common in those press releases for a particular, for each member. But it also said, look for phrases that are common among this for this member, but not common overall. Suddenly what you do is you end up with this specific interest uh, detector, right? So here's Kirsten Gillibrand, one of the senators in New York. And I can tell you that the first, if you can't see it, the first few phrases here are firefighter grant, fire department, and there's a contained breathing. These are the top most unique topics that she keeps surfacing in her press releases. Anybody know why? Why would that be? I can tell you that she fought pretty hard for benefits for World Trade Center first responders, right? So this is showing up. The bot is detecting her interest in those topics because it sets her apart from the rest of Congress. This is useful. This is in their represent feature now on ProPublica, so you can go and look up any congressperson and see what their um, most unique and uh, focused topics and of interest are. It also, the same algorithm, this column is looking at what other representatives and senators uh, this senator is like. And interestingly, the, the Chuck Schumer, who's the other senator from New York, is number one. That makes sense. But there's also um, a couple Democrats from Michigan and a couple of Republicans from upstate New York. Interesting. So we're seeing this is, this is journalism being done here. Like, how is she connected to other people in Congress? OK. Finally, I'm just going to do a little, uh, this is what all the toys were here for. Let's see if this will work. So this is something we do experiment with. Um, and it's the ability to recognize things. So computers are getting very good at detecting things in photographs. So here's a picture right on 6th Avenue in New York City. If I put this, drag this over to the Google Vision API, what you see, this, you can do this, it's very easy to do. What comes back is car, vehicle, road, lane, city, urban area, street. In seconds, it has detected what is in that picture and sent it back as text. And what's kind of amazing is that in the same way that you no longer need the entire globe's map information on your computer in order to get a map of anywhere on the world, thanks to Google and Google Maps, you, can also, you also have access to this kind of power for basically free and, uh, and put it to use. And so as a demonstration of that, I created this, I, I programmed this little Raspberry Pi with a pretty simple little program that takes a picture using the camera on the front of this Pi and sends that picture to the Google Vision API. And I wanted to just show that it was possible to just make something like this. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to this, you know the whole rule about don't do live demos? You know, I'm totally breaking that. Also, it relies on the internet, which is doubly problematic. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bottle, and I'm going to photograph it. Let's see if this, this is good. OK, a little red light just went on. And once that red light goes off, that means it has uploaded the picture to Google. Ah, it actually worked. We'll see if it detected anything. There's no screen on this thing. 
and no keyboard. So when I was building this, I was thinking, how in the world would I find out what it detected? And then I thought, oh, guess what? I have a keyboardless device over here. I can ask. Alexa, load latest photograph. Wow. The words I would use to describe what I see are lighting, interior design, flooring, and ceiling. Ah, okay. Did not see the bottle, but did see the flooring and the lighting. Probably got blinded by the light over there. So it worked, in a way. And now, oh, here's a quick one. All right. All right. So that was the video in case that didn't work. Okay. Um, finally, oh, and I'm out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna scoot through this. How many of you use Slack? Okay, so that's only about half of you, which is, I will tell you that your colleagues in the field, in journalism, it's more like 90 or 95%. So if you want to train your students in the world of journalism, make sure they know how to use Slack. <laughs> uh, we use it a lot. Uh, almost every conference when I talk to large groups of journalists, everybody in the room is using Slack. Um, Slack is a messaging tool. It's got several channels or rooms that you can uh, organize for your projects or your beats um, and share baby pictures. Um, we, uh, because so many journalists are using Slack, uh, Document Cloud, which is a nonprofit organization you may probably know about, um, and Quartz teamed up to make a bot inside Slack called QuackBot. QuackBot is Quartz and Slack smashed together, QuackBot. Um, so th the idea here is that we're making a chatty bot that will, uh, that will live inside Slack to help journalists do their jobs. And so you can actually talk to QuackBot. Here I've said hello, and QuackBot says hi there. I'm here to help journalists do common ch tasks from Slack. Um, how are you today? I'm doing swimmingly. So it, it understands natural language. Um, but it, I can also say, um, uh, could, you get, could I get some data about agriculture? And it will return three very trusted data sources that have been put to, uh, part of a spreadsheet put together by another person who used to work at Qu Quartz, Chris Groskopf. Um, and so suddenly I have reliable data about agriculture, plus I have a link to the whole list. I can say, take a screenshot of QZ.com. It will take a screenshot and send it to me in Slack. It will do some other things, including saving pages to the Internet Archive. Uh, it will scan a page for cliches. That's kind of a fun thing that we, <laughs> we were playing with. Um, and it's going to do even more useful things to journalists, including scan PDFs for text and get, send that back to you, upload a PDF to Document Cloud and let you publish it live right from Slack, uh, make quick charts using Quartz's Atlas uh, system, and then uh, also like monitoring web pages. So if you want to monitor the police department's website for new data, it will tell you when new data is posted. We're also opening this up, and we already have, to the entire nerd journalism community who builds tools, they build tools all the time. We're bringing those tools into Slack so it's easier for journalists to use. And you all as journalism educators are also welcome and, um, and cleared for using this too. So feel free to sign up for it. It's at documentcloud.org slash quackbot. It's free. It's going to be cool. It's kind of cool now. It's going to be more cool soon. Um, all of these things that I've talked about are d uh, detailed on our website at Quartz called bots.qz.com. The entire Bot Studio is funded in part by the Knight Foundation. And um, we're posting the code the experiences, the failures, the successes, all on this uh, website. So you are welcome to it. It's part of our uh, agreement with Knight to share all that stuff, plus we just like to do it anyway. Uh, if, you, if you didn't get some of those URLs, we have documentcloud.org slash quackbot, bots.qz.com. Bots at qz.com is a mailing list if you want to reach us. Um, and there's me on email and Twitter. And we'll take questions after Joe, who's up next. Thank you, John.